We're taking a journey back in time today, back to the time of the kings, when the nation of Israel split in civil war. The northern kingdom has been taken into captivity, and now the Assyrian army is at the gates of Jerusalem, threatening to take the southern kingdom too. Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and today our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, takes us to this exciting place in Scripture, where we'll see King Hezekiah turn to God and call on a prophet named Isaiah. So grab your Bible and turn to 2 Kings chapter 19. And while you do, let's share a couple of letters from the Bible bus. First, we hear from Joan in Middleton, New Jersey. Dear fellow Bible bus passengers, as I reflect on my time as a World Prayer Team member, my heart is especially touched by those writing who were in bondage to Islam and have come to a saving faith in Jesus. How sad they cannot safely share this with family and friends because they may lose their lives. I am moved with joy and sorrow for them as they have found and accepted the truth, no matter the cost. What an example of faith and courage and power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise his name. I am looking forward to my second year on the Bible bus. Thank you for this wonderful ministry. Well, thank you so much, Joan, for sharing your heart. It's great to have you aboard the Bible bus. Next, we've got an email. This is from a longtime listener named Tomessa. I have been on the Bible bus for many years. I first heard Dr. McGee's program on KGER when I was in high school in the 1950s in Long Beach, California. Wow. I used to stay with my elderly aunt during the summer, and she would turn on the radio at bedtime. She was blind, so listening to God's Word was a pleasure for her. To make a long story short, I've listened to Dr. McGee off and on all these years. I now make a small automatic contribution each month. I am 78 years old and in poor health. However, the Lord Jesus is more real to me today than ever. It is such a blessing to know God loves me without reservation. I thank him daily for Dr. McGee's sound Bible teaching. I also enjoy the daily World Prayer Team email each day. Recently, I found out from your emails that the nation of Mauritania still has slaves. Every day I pray for godly change there. Please know that I thank God for your work and the faithful way that you have continued Dr. McGee's program long after his promotion to heaven. Well, thank you, Tomessa, for your faithful prayers and your support of the Bible bus. Your note really was an encouragement. Well, if God is calling you to join listeners like Joan and Tomessa in faithfully praying for and supporting through the Bible, then call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE or visit us at ttb.org. And remember, it's only through the grace of God and the support of listeners like you that the Bible bus continues its journey in your neighborhood and almost everywhere else on earth. We're so grateful to those of you who have joined hearts and hands with us as we bring God's whole word to the whole world. Now let's pray. Heavenly Father, use your word to bless, challenge, and grow us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we come back to Isaiah, the prophet, here in the 19th chapter. He comes to the foreground, actually, for the first time. And it's during the reign of Hezekiah. Now, we saw last time that this man, Hezekiah, came to the throne at a time when it was very troubled and disturbed and uncertain in that land. The northern kingdom was taken into captivity by Assyria. Now, the army of Assyria has come to the very gates of Jerusalem. And this is enough to frighten Hezekiah. And added to that, Rabshakeh, who is the henchman of the king of Assyria, why he is outside the gate and he is sending out taunts and insults and making great boasting about what the king of Assyria is going to do to Jerusalem. And he threatens them. He said that the king of Assyria is going to take Jerusalem, going to take the people into captivity. Then he says, your God will not deliver you. And the reason he gives is 
none of the gods of the other people that we've captured has helped them a bit. Poor Hezekiah wilts under this, and naturally he would, because this man is just learning to turn to the Lord and to trust him. And so he appeals now to Isaiah, God's prophet. And I begin reading now at chapter 19, verse 1. It came to pass when King Hezekiah heard it, that is, heard all of this boasting, ranting, and threatening, why it disturbed him. And he ran his clothes, he covered himself with sackcloth, and he went into the house of the Lord. That's a good place to go when you are in a mental turmoil that this man is in. It's time to turn to God. And we find here that he sent Eliakim, which was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. Now he wants a word from God. I wonder if you've noted in these days in which we're living, we talk about we're a Christian nation, and we think of poor old King Hezekiah was sort of a pagan anyway, half pagan, and that people in that day were very pagan, and we are very sophisticated today, and that we are Christian. But we're not. Have you ever heard today in all of our disturbed conditions, have you ever heard of any politician, any educator, any great leader, any military man, anyone in a high position today suggesting that we turn to God and that we appeal to him, that we look to him for deliverance? No, may I say that today they... Listen to this expert and this man who is a brain. He has a very high IQ, and he is one that can advise. These are the men that are listened to today, and they've been listened to now, friends, ever since I was a young man. And that's a long span now. And we get farther and farther into the night. Our problems are mounting. Our difficulties are overwhelming us today. And nowhere do you hear anyone, not even in the church today, is there an appeal to God, to turn to God in this dark and late hour in the history of our nation. Well, we are 200 years old, and we are a young nation, and we are already old and on the way out. The life of most nations has been, I'm told, around 200 years. Well, we've had it. It looks like we've had it, but there's no turning to God today. I believe that there was a sincere turning to God. Instead of an appeal to God, it's always, let's get together. Let's join up. Let's try a new approach. Let's get a new method. Let's call in an expert. Let's work on this from a different angle. Let's get an authority in a certain field, psychology or medicine or government our education, and they're going to show the way out. My friend, all of these great experts have moved us farther into the night. We're in trouble today. We need God. No nation ever needed God as this nation needs God at this hour in which we're living. Thank God, old Hezekiah, if you want to call him half-pagan, go ahead and call him that. We need some half-pagans today then, because this man called on God. And now he calls for Isaiah. Now will you notice, verse 3, And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble, and of rebuke, and blasphemy. For the children have come to the birth, and there's not strength to bring forth. It may be that the Lord thy God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria, his master, hath sent to reproach the living God and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that are left. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah. Now they brought this message. But he didn't say, even this man didn't say, our God. He says, thy God. Poor Hezekiah. Yes, maybe he's a half-pagan, but he's got sense enough to appeal to God in a time like this. 
In fact, he hasn't any other place to go at this present moment. Now, verse 6, And Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall ye say to your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I'll send a blast upon him. He shall hear a rumor, and shall return to his own land, and I'll cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Now, this, may I say, was literally fulfilled, by the way, in a most wonderful way. But notice the encouragement that Isaiah gives to the king. He said, don't worry about this man. He's not going to come into your city. He's just a blowhard. He's just boasting and blaspheming. But God has heard him. God's going to deal with him. You do not need to worry. Or if we'd only learn to let God deal with our enemies. The trouble of it is we deal with them and then we remove ourselves from the place of faith, trusting God, and then God doesn't move in our behalf. And as a result, why, we come off on the short end of a deal. When if we just turn it over to the Lord, the Lord would handle it lots better than we would, as he did in this case. Now, instead, though, of something happening immediately to the king of Assyria and the Assyrian army, why, they came back. They returned and camped outside of the city of Jerusalem again. Now, notice verse 8. So Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he had heard that he was departed from Lachish. And when he heard say of Perhaka, king of Ethiopia, behold, he's come out to fight against thee, he sent messengers again unto Hezekiah. Now here they come, they're outside the wall again. Listen to this. Thus shall ye speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God in whom thou trustest deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands by destroying them utterly, and shalt thou be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them, which my fathers have destroyed, as Gozan, Haran, Rezeph, and the children of Eden, which were in Thelacer? Where is the king of Hamath, and the king of Arpad, and the king of the city of Sepharvim, of Hina and Iva? Believe me, this is disturbing to Hezekiah. The king of Assyria swept everything before him. Why does Hezekiah think he will escape? Now, verse 18. And Hezekiah received the letter. See, he gets a letter now. Of the hand of the messengers, and he read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord, and he spread it before the Lord. My friend, that's the place where you and I need to spread that disturbing letter that you receive. And we get some wonderful letters here on radio. We get some of the other kind, too, by the way. But may I say that we've learned a long time ago, we just turn these over to the Lord, let him work the problem out, and... So far, he's done a very good job at that sort of thing. Hezekiah's doing a very wise thing. He spreads the letter out before the Lord. Spread out your problem, your trouble, before the Lord. Friends, that's where you need to take your troubles, need to take your problems. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Now, and Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubims, Thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see. And hear the words of Sennacherib, which hath sent him to reproach the living God. Martin Luther, by the way, prayed like that. I have several prayers of Martin Luther. And the way that man prayed, we ought to pray I think like that today. My, how these men could lay hold to God. Martin Luther could say, Lord, are you hearing me? <laughs> Lord, hear me. <laughs> Lord, let your ear be open to my prayer. And he'd cry out to God. You ever feel like that? Maybe God wasn't listening to you. Now, that's the way Hezekiah felt. 
He says, of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations in their land. This man's told the truth. He's not boasting when he says that they've swept everything before them and they've cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they've destroyed them. Now, therefore, Lord our God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. Now, God's going to answer his prayer. He sends Isaiah. Verse 20, Then Isaiah the son of Amos sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, That which thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib king of Assyria, I have heard. I heard your prayer. You didn't have to shout. <laughs> I heard you all the time. This is the word that the Lord hath spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, hath despised thee and laughed thee to scorn, the daughter of Jerusalem hath shaken her head at thee. Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed? And against whom hast thou exalted thy voice and lifted up thine eyes on high, even against the Holy One of Israel? Now, he goes on to say here that God intends to destroy the army of Assyria. And God says, Hast thou not heard, verse 25, long ago how I've done it? And of ancient times have I formed it? Now have I brought it to pass that thou shouldst be to lay waste fenced cities into ruinous heaps. Therefore their inhabitants were of small power. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field and as the green herb, as the grass on the housetops, and as corn blasted before it's grown up. But I know thy abode and thy going out and thy coming in, thy rage against me. Because thy rage against me and thy tumult has come up into mine ears, therefore I'll put my hook in thy nose and my bridle in thy lips, and I'll turn thee back by the way which thou camest. God says, you're coming down into my land. You've made your boast, but I'm going to put hooks in your jaws. I'll pull you right up out of the land. I'm going to send you back home, give you a good spanking, and send you home. And this shall be a sign unto thee. Ye shall eat this year such things as grow of themselves. And in the second year that which springeth of the same. And in the third year sow ye and reap and plant vineyards and eat the fruits thereof. In other words, God says he won't even be able to get the crop that is growing out in the fields right now. And he goes on and makes this statement. And the remnant that is escaped to the house of Judah shall yet again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor cast a bank against it. Now, you see, Isaiah's making a very bold statement. But, of course, he's giving the word of the Lord. And the question is, is Isaiah a true prophet? You see, when Isaiah said a virgin shall conceive, bring forth a child, somebody said, my, that's a great prophecy. When will it take place? Suppose he'd say, well, be 700 years. And I'm sure a great many folk could look at each other and say, well, Brother Isaiah, we don't know whether that'll be true or not. None of us will be around. But now there is an enemy outside the gates of Jerusalem. Assyria has swept everything before them. All nations have fallen before them, and they were feared and dreaded in the ancient world. They've come to the gates of Jerusalem and withdrawn. Now God says their army will be out there, but they are not even going to be able to besiege this city. They'll not even shoot an arrow into the city. Now, you think that over for a moment. There are a 100,000 soldiers around the walls of Jerusalem. Now, out of that many, you'd certainly find some trigger-happy soldier with a bow and arrow, and maybe he just wants to see what might happen, and he puts an arrow in a bow, he pulls the bow, and shoots it over the wall of Jerusalem. My friend, if he does that, Isaiah is not a true prophet of God. 
God says, not an arrow is going to fall in that city. And he says it by the mouth of Isaiah. Now, that's the way you tell whether a prophet's true or not. False prophet could never have made a statement like that. Now, God says, I'm going to save this city. And the reason I'm going to save it is this, by the way that he came by, the same shall he return. And he shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake. God does many things for his name's sake. And for my servant David's sake. That's important too. You see, God loved David. He did many things for David's sake. And friends, David had a greater son, a virgin-born son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And God does many things for him. He'll save sinners that will trust him as Savior. It's a wonderful thing. For my servant David's sake, for Christ's sake. That's what it means to pray in Jesus' name. God does it for him, not for us. Now, it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out, and he smote in the camp of the Syrians a hundred, fourscore, and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. You know, I love the way this translation has it. When they woke in the morning, they were all dead corpses. Well, friends, they didn't wake in the morning. <laughs> they didn't wake. Why didn't they wake? Well, they were dead. Those that did wake up found out that there were about 185,000 dead out there. They didn't wake up. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed, and he went and returned and dwelt at Nineveh. And it came to pass, as he was worshiping in the house of Nisra, his god, that Adramelech and Sherezer, his sons, smote him with a sword, and they escaped into the land of Armenia. And Ezer Hadden, his son, reigned in his stead. Isn't that interesting? That prophecy was literally fulfilled in that day. Now we're coming to a great chapter, and one that's very meaningful to me. I told you I like this man, Hezekiah, most delightful person since the days of David, since we've looked at David. We're going to see this man was sick, and he was sick unto death. Had a boil. I have a notion it was cancer. And because I have cancer, it makes this story very meaningful to me. And I happen to know that there are many of you out there that have cancer also, because you've written. That's one of the reasons I always offer the encouragement I do in my own case because so many folk are out there. And friends, when you got cancer, you're under a cloud. I don't care who you are, what your situation is, you're under a cloud. And I want to be helpful. hope I can be helpful. And next time, I want to talk about Hezekiah's illness and recovery. And we won't be looking at that which is fanaticism. But the way that God did it then, and I'm here to bear witness that God does it the same way today. How wonderful he is. And we're going to talk about that next time. Let me just get us into the atmosphere by reading the first verse of chapter 20. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Well, I want to tell you that's pretty discouraging news. He didn't want to die. I don't want to die. I don't imagine you do. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord. He turned his face to the wall, prayed unto the Lord. He says, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now. How I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept so. I have great sympathy for that man. I did the same thing he did. <laughs> and I cried out to God. May I say to you, God hears and answers prayer. We want to talk about that tomorrow. And if you have a friend that has cancer or has a fatal disease, Ask them to tune in with us next time. So until then, may God richly bless you. What a great study. 
I hope that you'll join us tomorrow and invite a friend or family member who may need to hear how God used illness in the life of Hezekiah and in Dr. McGee's life. In the meantime, if you'd like to know more about how you can get our brand new 2018 wall calendar, then check out the beautiful pictures online at ttb.org. Our new calendar is called Through Every Open Door, and it focuses our attention on the opportunities that we have to take God's whole word to the whole world. The images are beautiful doors from all over the world. I think that you'll really love this calendar all year long. I know I will. Order yours online at ttb.org or just give us a call at 1-800-652-4253. Well, I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll meet you back here tomorrow as we continue our journey through the Bible. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.